Hey guys, Dan here, and welcome again to that paintball channel. For this episode, we come at long last to the barrel accuracy main event, and that is the question of barrel boring. Uh, whether or not one should overmatch or underbore to get the best accuracy. Now, I'm going to say up front that there is so much history, so much data, and so much controversy behind this question. There's no way a single video is going to do it justice. Moreover, uh, this video is very likely to ruffle some feathers depending upon which side of the issue you happen to be on. I know for my part I had some feathers ruffled simply because I found some uh, information, data, results that I wasn't expecting to find in the course of my research. So to give a little backstory, the the question of how one should uh, bore one's paint goes way back to the early days of paintballs. Early as 93, 94, you had manufacturers like BOA who were putting out uh, sort of barrel kits. You know, I think BOA had a tournament pack where you had three different barrels, three different bore sizes, because the understanding was paint changes, paint just comes in different sizes, and you want to sort of get that ideal uh, barrel match. And usually, and not always, but usually the thinking was, a match bore situation was the ideal. So something like a blow through. Uh, doesn't just drop through, you know, you're not having to really push it through, but something you can blow through, that's kind of the ideal. And you had some testing, you know, AGD as they did with everything else, did did some testing, and there were a few other entities that did testing, but for the most part that was just something that rode under the surface. And the paintball playing public wasn't terribly interested in that part. Most of what they were after was just the bottom line, you know, what's going to give me the best results. And so a lot of times, you know, they would fall victim to marketing tactics of barrel manufacturers and things like that. So there wasn't a ton of science that going into the manufacturer or, or design of barrels. Now, it wasn't until 2000, 2001, Smart Parts came out with a free kit. I think they applied for the patent in December of 2000. Uh, the product came out in 01, but you know I'm sure uh, pro teams had been field testing it before that. And that was a real game changer because you had in a single, very modular package the ability to uh, cover a wide range of boring situations. But again, the thinking was to match bore. Now, uh, you still had some entities doing testing. Uh, Paintball Times did a very large test comparing the Freak Kit to a number of other barrels. They used a lot of different kinds of paint. And it was a massive test. Uh, to date, I think, still the biggest test, single test that's ever been done. But again, it wasn't huge in the public mind. It wasn't until 2007 when Mann, uh, that's his screen handle, did a really large test. He posted the results in a number of uh, online forums. PB Nation's probably the, the most uh, accessible one. And he did a really rigorous test. Tested a number of different paints, a number of different barrels, a lot, but not so many that you know it wasn't manageable. Really strictly controlled conditions. I mean, he made sure he measured bore sizes. He measured paint, weighed the paint. He had a legitimate you know, set up for the marker, you know, it was benched and viced. It wasn't just some guy standing out in a field shooting at, at a target somewhere and expecting to get results. You know, and by the way, if you see videos like that, just sort of click away or recognize you're not going to get any meaningful data from that. Uh, but, you know, man's test really put the question of testing itself into the public consciousness, really generated a lot of, of uh, conversation and a lot of interest. And that was really what kind of got the ball rolling. Well, as is typical, uh, you know, as soon as one person is really putting something out there, you get other people saying, well, hey, what about this? And sure enough, the following year, Punk Works came out and said, well, look, you know, man has done this great test. This is fantastic. But, you know, we have some new questions and he's making some assumptions about the ideal boring, situa uh, boring situation. You know, he's assuming that match bore is the best, but is it really? So they began to do some tests, you know, trying to compare match versus over versus under boring. And what they began to uh, discover was that, you know, there were some strong benefits with respect to under boring. And they showed again and again and again that if you went with an under bore, you could get really good efficiency and really good velocity consistency.
and they begin to really push for this. Uh, and they pushed for it uh, so successfully that they eventually in time came to, I think in many ways, change the landscape of how barrels are done. You know, barrel manufacturers changed the design of barrels, I think in many ways, in large part in response to uh, punk works testing and they were to show you know again and again and again that this is an ideal situation if you're looking for efficiency and velocity consistency well that wasn't the end of the road you know other people began to weigh in with their own tests and you know people are always trying to get different angles and think about it in different ways and um, RNT Lee and some other folks began to do testing and say well wait a minute we're getting really good results from overboring so you know, that in itself began to really generate this big controversy. And then other people began to weigh in and say, well, you know, this doesn't seem to fit, you know, there, you know, such a long history of match boring. You're going to have people who are sort of on board with that. And at the same time, you had people who would look at, uh, you know, professional players who by that time and even to today were going with a greater tendency to overbore. And so people would say, well, you know, what about this? You know, so Punkworks is really pushing for underbore, underbore, underbore. And they were showing, look, you know, if you're talking about efficiency, velocity, consistency, the best situation is an underbore followed by an overbore followed by a matchbore. So an underbore is both uh, efficient and velocity consistent. An overbore, yes, it's velocity consistent, but it's not that efficient. And then match bore is kind of all over the place. But then you had people again who would say, well, the pros, they overbore. And, you know, some of the, the response was, well, you know, they're pros, they're sponsored, they do what they're told to do, they shoot what they're told to shoot. But then the counter to that was, well, yeah, pros do have sponsors, but they also want to win. And within those sponsorships, they still have wiggle room and they have choices and these high-end markers are usually coming with kits and nobody's telling them what bore configuration to use why is it that they are tending again not always but tending to go overboard so this really stirred up a lot of controversy a lot of heat and a lot of testing you know so much testing came after that just as a way of trying to you know weigh in on the conversation and make sense of it because punk works you know, the big name of the game in science is it, it, results ought to be repeatable. And Punkworks was able to show again and again and again that, yeah, you want to get efficiency, you want to get velocity consistency, you need to underbore. Well, people like RNT Lee, and there were a few others, were showing again and again and again, we're getting good accuracy results with overboring. So I'm looking at this, and, you know, I'd done some smaller tests on my own, and I, I, I seem to have sort of mixed results and I wanted to make sense of this. So something that occurred to me was that no one, to my knowledge, had ever put all of the tests together into one entity and just treated all the tests that had ever been put out there as a single organism and then tried to make sense of the data in that way. You know, um, so some of the tests were larger, some of the tests were smaller. And, you know, one of the big criticisms of some of the tests were that, you know, that the, the data sets were so small, you know, you'd have shot strings of maybe 20 to 25. Well, that's fine if you're using something like perfect circle, but because paint is so inconsistent, you know, each and every ball is, is a snowflake. There are no two that are the same unless you're dealing with perfect circle. And so the, the differences from ball to ball to ball, are going to be so substantial that your margins of error are themselves going to be significant. So what you need are really big data sets. And as I said, the biggest test that has ever been done, to my knowledge, was the Paintball Times test back in 01, where they shot a thousand rounds through each barrel. And they shot five different kinds of paint. So you're talking, you know, 200 uh, rounds of each different kind of paint. So that's 10 times what the, the standard uh, number of, of balls that the, the more modern tests were using. So that's good data. So I, I wanted to plug all of this stuff into just, you know, one pile and see if some kinds of trends or patterns could, could emerge. Cause it, it didn't make sense that this person or this group of people were getting consistent results and this 
you know, group of people was getting consistent results, and yet they seemed to be at odds. So I just sort of laid everything out in a matrix and just let the data speak for itself. And what I found, some of it was not surprising, but some of it was very surprising. And, you know, sure enough, you know, if you lay it out from best paint to worst paint, accuracy goes from best to worst. It follows the quality of the paint. But another trend that I saw was that accuracy went from best to worst when you moved from an overbore to an underbore. Now, remember that Punkworks had really been advocating for underbore because of the issue of uh, efficiency and velocity consistency. And I myself, in a previous video, talked about regulators and saying, you know, it's, markers are, are good to have regulators because in an ideal world on paper, if you can put every ball, you know, out downrange with a consistently regulated uh, impulse of air, that goes a long way toward generating accuracy. And on paper, that makes sense, and that's true. But when it comes to the hard data that's out there, that relationship is dubious at best. Because indeed, you know, when you're looking at all the data that's out there, and that includes Punkworks' own data, you know, you see uh, situations where, particularly when you have, you know, velocity uh, numbers posted next to target vectors, many situations where uh, the, the boring configuration that produced the best velocity consistency had the worst downrange target consistency and vice versa. You know, several situations where, uh, you know, the, the boring configuration that produced the best accuracy, in other words, the smallest target vector, had the worst velocity consistency. So that was a profound surprise to me. You know, the, the data simply doesn't support it. And the data absolutely does not support underboring as being more accurate. On the contrary, the data overwhelmingly shows that from a target consistency point of view, the best configuration by far is an overbore followed by a match bore followed by an underbore. And that's talking about all paints, all boring situations, all conditions across the board. And by the way, that includes even Punkworks' own data. Now, you know, some of these tests are inconclusive, you know, so, you know, bear this in mind that even with respect to Punkworks, yes, some of their tests did in fact show very clearly you move from an overbore to a match bore to an underbore, your target consistency goes from best to okay to worst. Uh, but some of their tests were inconclusive and they sort of didn't show anything either way. But it is interesting and people did call them out on it and say, hey, you know, you're advocating for this underbore situation, but when you think about target consistency, the best situation is what we've been saying. You know, so my guess is that the two factions were sort of keying in on different kinds of consistency. One side, sort of the RNT Lee faction, is focusing on target consistency. The punk work side of things is focusing on velocity consistency. But as I said, looking at all the data, and it's, you know, it seems as though the two factions never really were put into conversation with one another, but as I looked at all the data, it became very clear the two aren't related. You know, they're not meaningful, you know, you, you can't, you can't show a strong correlation between the two. So that was very interesting, and I was not expecting that at all. Uh, so, you know, how do we make sense of this? Well, something that Punkworks did point out was that, you know, as you really start to get into extreme underbore situations, your, your accuracy does go down. And so they began to speculate, well, it seems that spin is clearly being induced. And, you know, if you're wondering about this, if you think about something like this as a little Delrin cylinder, if you were to pinch this, you kind of know what's going to happen. It's going to go flying. But the reason that it's going to go flying with a spin is because the static friction on either side is going to give way unevenly when it finally lets go. You know, one side is going to let go before the other, and that's going to induce spin. And indeed, that's what you see with, uh, I think, uh, underboring. That no matter how well-made a barrel is, 
the paint is wildly inconsistent. It's not round. So when it finally exits the bore, regardless of whether or not that's a single or two piece barrel, it's gonna let go unevenly. And so spin is gonna be induced. And the more extreme the underbore, the more spin is gonna be induced. And that is why I think that you see better numbers for an overbore situation. It's because the overbore, yes, it's not ideal to have the paint bouncing around like that, but the overbore situation is more forgiving. Now, uh, I will say that there's a caveat to this. I did also see another pattern. Again, it was just a general trend. Certain kinds of paint, particularly marbleizer, at least in the, in the formulation that was being used when these tests were conducted, lended itself more forgivingly to underboring. That is to say, marbleizer did a lot better with an underbore than other kinds of paint did. My guess is because that sort of formulation was very slick, very oily, that that helped to mitigate some of the, those friction issues and minimize the amount of spin that was induced. That's just a guess, but it is interesting that it was, it was clear marbleizer did show itself as being different from other kinds of paint. Um, and you'll notice that a lot of testing that Punkworks did was with marbleizer. And so I'm wondering if that didn't have something to do with it. Now, putting all that into, you know, perspective, you know, people would still say, well, you know, I still disagree or it's a matter of preference. Guys, you know, we're talking about science here. You know, people say, well, there's no real right or wrong answer. It's just about preference. That's simply not true. The data is the data. Now, there may be other, you know, data sets that are out there that don't support this. Uh, but I've talked to, you know, some folk who've done their own testing. Um, and they too seem to have shown similar kinds of results that yeah uh, efficiency velocity consistency underboard definitely but for accuracy overboard definitely seems to be best and so the practice of the pros is indeed uh, borne out at least with respect to the data that's out there uh, remember we're always talking about just what's on paper so at the same time bear in mind that you know paint is still the dominant factor here. Good quality paint with an underbore is still going to be a better situation usually than lesser quality paint even with an overbore. So yes, an overbore is more forgiving, but good quality paint is most forgiving. So ideally you'd have high quality paint with an overbore, um, but if you can't get that, you know, a, a good quality paint with an underbore still is a, a very good situation. I would say, you know, if you're shooting something like an autococker, you have to at least match and or underbore. Because if you're running around and a ball falls out and you go to take a shot, that's not accurate. And I think, you know, some of these findings may offer a clue into the sort of mystique of autocockers. You know, back in the day especially, in order to shoot an autococker at any kind of real competitive level, you had to have sunk a lot of money into it. And if you could afford to put that much money into your marker, chances were high that you were going to be inclined and able to purchase high quality paint. And so I think that's a large part of why autocockers came to have that, that sort of aura of you know superb accuracy, when in fact they're no more or less accurate than any other marker, measure for measure. So as I said, a lot of stuff um, for thought, uh, many, many pieces of information and insights that I was not expecting. And, you know, I learned a tremendous amount over the course of doing this uh, particular episode and all the back research that went into it. Hopefully this has been useful to you. Um, I really think that, you know, this in some ways leads us into new kinds of questions about you know, what does the optimal barrel now really look like given, given all this data. But at any rate, uh, I had a lot of fun um, digging through all this information, uh, piecing it together, but really was not expecting to find what I found. But, you know, the data is the data. And no matter how I crunched the numbers, it worked out the same. So pretty significant. Um, hope you found it interesting. Looking forward to the next episode. Come on back. Bring a friend.